So I was wondering whether there was a way that we could move over from using um, bare machine level system calls and provide something that looks more like a library interface the user space can call. Um, there's been some recent discussions and work that suggest that this uh, is an interface that may work. Um, so the generic BDSO work, for example, has looked at deploying, um, deploying the VDSO interface across multiple architectures. And basically my work explores some ideas about how we might make use of that for all system calls. So um, I'll just take a moment to explain what I mean by ABI. You all know what this means, of course. Um, application binary interface is the machine level or assembler level interface between user space and the kernel. But there are some different ways we could interpret the notion of what the kernel is. So Linux is a project. It has a Git tree. It's maintained by a community of people, some of whom are here. Um, it's also might be viewed as the binary blob that the bootloader loads and that runs in privilege mode, or you can view it as an API or an interface where you don't necessarily care about how it's implemented. Um, in Linux land, what tends to happen in practice is we have the Linux kernel project and we develop the blob that runs privileged. And that blob has access to the privileged features of the CPU. And user space is mostly the other stuff. It's not developed specifically by this community, and it doesn't have access to privileged CPU features. And the ABI is the interface that those two things use to talk to each other. Mostly where I say kernel in this talk, I'll mean the thing that runs privileged, though um, obviously not everything that's part of the kernel or part of this project runs privileged. So what's the impact of that? Well, in practice, a lot of the stuff that we develop ends up in the privileged code base of the kernel, um, which means we tend to accumulate in privileged mode some glue and legacy stuff, um, features that are valuable but have been superseded by more flexible interfaces over time, um, backwards compatibility stuff, and some things that seemed like a good idea when we originally added them but may not seem like such a good idea now. Um, but because these are exposed via this low-level interface, they tend to be stuck running in privileged mode forever, and we can never get rid of them unless we are happy to break backwards compatibility. So just to give some simple examples of some odd cases, there are some calls like personality and set robots list, which really do nothing more than access a variable on behalf of user space. Um, some of the signal-related syscalls also don't do much more than that, although they can be a little bit more involved. Um, but the impact of exposing these in the syscall ABI is that we have an inevitable trap into the kernel every time we call them. Do they really require privilege? Could we just, if they're just accessing a variable on behalf of user space, could we just put that variable in user memory instead? Um, sometimes there are other concerns, for example, there may be an expectation that the whole call is atomic. Um, newer architectures provide some ways of ensuring that that didn't necessarily exist when these interfaces were invented. So sometimes things that couldn't have um, executed in user space when they originally introduced might be more feasible to do now. So is there anything we can do to change this situation? Well. Um, the alternative that occurs to me is that we use some kind of user space library interface instead. Um, but if it's a separate library, then we have to ask the question of who maintains it. It's either going to be maybe done in a user space C library, say glibc, glibc or Bionic or something else. But those are developed by different communities. They may do different things from each other. They may not be completely in sync with what the kernel's doing. Um, another option is that it's just a separate standalone library. Uh, but again, we can't force people to use it. Different people may invent their own. And again, there's a risk of fragmentation. 
So it would be nice if we could maintain this thing as part of the kernel project, but not have it run privileged. And if we do that, we have the option to keep it tightly coupled to the kernel version, which gives us more flexibility to refactor and re-implement how things work over time. And we all have, we already have something that, that ticks a lot of these boxes, the VDSO, which is this fake shared library that the kernel can map into user space for user space to call. Um, it's not deployed on all architectures today, but it is on several. Yes? Um, first of all, um, the VDSO has problems when it comes to checkpoint restart. So relying on that alone is probably not a good idea. Um, the idea of having a lib kernel is something I personally have proposed for uh, quite a long time. If, if that is you know, something that people think is a good idea, um, I am more than happy to take um, the infrastructure I wrote for Calibc, which provides very, very thin layer system calls, um, and just do that for the system calls that do not require, that, that do not have wrappers um, mm -hmm. for, you know, for example, glibc has its own uh, struct term iOS. You can't, you, you can't implement those things in a library because you will, you know, in a kernel specific library because it will do the wrong things. Yeah, well, it's glibc that defines that interface. But there is a lot of things in our ABI that where all, all, all that happens is we just pass things straight through. Yeah. And that is something that we could do very, very easily in a lib kernel. Yeah, and so I, I focused on using the VDSO as a mechanism, but there are probably other ways you could do this. You could maybe ship a library in the kernel or some other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, you might uh, want to state why you're concerned about VDSO and checkpoint restart. I assume it's because of state being held in the VDSO page. <clears throat> Right, um, because when you do a checkpoint restart, if you are pulling out, you know, you are now having a potentially, actually most likely very different VDSO. If your instruction pointer or, or, uh, is inside the VDSO, or you have issues with your, VDS, with, with your VDSO data, uh, you could end up in quite the mess yeah. and, and as a result most of the checkpoint restarts uh, implementation these they simply unmap the VDSO. Yeah, um, there were some discussions on this yesterday as well and yes, this, um, yeah. so this doesn't create new problems with the VDSO of that sort but as you say yeah. problems already exist. Right, but um, a <coughs> library, a, a, a user space library um, can be maintained forward compatible, so that so that it uh, so that when the checkpoint restart, it also checkpoint restarts the library together with all the other user space stuff. And um, yes, you are only providing a subset of the functionality that you would in a new, in in a newer kernel, but you're doing that anyway. That yeah. old application can only use that subset anyhow. So, in that sense having it as a standalone library in user space um, will you know, inherently resolve that problem. So, so the big problem you're trying to solve is uh, legacy, right? We have a lot of, well, not just necessarily legacy, but um, we, have a, we have accumulated a lot of syscalls already that um, you pretty much want to just move from kernel space to somewhere else where it's less privileged, which is Potentially. Reasonable. And there are, that's, some that's things the, which, use case. there are some things which don't necessarily need to go into the kernel at all if we're flexible to change how they're implemented. Correct. So the problem is that if they already exist, we cannot move them to a lib kernel because we still have to adhere to old user space that calls those syscalls, right? With yeah, so that's something I explore here, one way of working around that, though it does use the VDSO as a platform, so there may be issues with that, but 
this is really a bag of ideas, and I want to see what people think. Um, okay, so thank you for that. I will carry on. Um, so you rightly make the point about backwards compatibility. Um, we can update user space software to call some library, um, but older binaries are obviously still going to make direct syscalls, and we have to still make that work somehow. Um, we could keep all the backwards compatibility glue in the kernel, but if part of the object of the exercise was to move that stuff out of the kernel, then it makes the exercise maybe a bit pointless. So I wondered if there was some feasible way to bounce old style system calls back out into user space and have user space handle that somehow. Um, so mentioning this to people, the first thing they tended to say was, well, doesn't SecComp do that sort of thing? So I thought I would experiment and see what I could build on top of that. Um, so SecComp gives us the ability to filter system calls and um, decide whether to allow the kernel to execute them or just trap them back out to user space using a signal. Um, so if we want to filter syscalls based on where in user space they came from, then we need some information about what's sitting in the user space address space. To keep things simple, I just uh, extended the set comp data structure that's part of the filter with some bounds information to tell us where the VDSO is at the moment. Um, and I envisaged that to make use of this, the C library would install a suitable filter and a handler for this signal on process startup. Now that has a world of issues, but it was just, this was just a hack to see what we could get working. Um, so I have some hacks in a, a Git tree that there's some references at the end of this slide deck, which you can follow up later if you want. Um, but just to illustrate, so I tacked uh, a lower and upper bound for um, the instruction pointer that say whether it's in the VDSO or not. Um, sorry. Just onto the end of the existing set comp data. Um, and then I cooked up a set comp filter. You don't really need to read this, but just to give an indication of how much code there was, it's just checking the instruction pointer against two bounds. If, if it's within bounds, we allow the syscall. If it came from some other user space address, then we trap the syscall using a signal. Uh, this is using classic BPF because I hadn't got my head fully around eBPF at the time. Um, so we probably could do a bit better than this. But anyway, that's, that's the rough scale of it. Um, so when we trap a syscall out into user space, then we need to handle that. And uh, the skeleton handler might look something like this. Um, the details of how to extract the system call number and arguments is obviously going to be architecture specific. Um, but once we've extracted that information, we could handle things in a generic way, much as uh, they're handled in the kernel. So we might have a switch on the syscall number to catch any system calls that we want to do something special with. And then for other system calls, um, we can fall through and call some stub. For getting this working, I added a stub in the VDSO, which will just make a syscall using the arguments supplied. Um, because that comes from the VDSO now, it won't be bounced again, and the system call will just be executed. So does this work? Well, signals are a recipe for invasiveness and interacting badly with things in general. Um, so I didn't expect this to be entirely foolproof. Um, one obvious thing here, the signal frame is generally pretty big, so we're adding quite a lot to the stack footprint of a thread compared with what it would otherwise um, have required. Um, and to be honest, I didn't attempt to winkle all the seg faults out of this because there are things that you probably can't make work anyway. Um, it was good enough to run LS. It wasn't quite good enough to run Emacs, but <laughs> somewhere in between there, it was probably a sweet spot. Um, the fact that things worked at all, I was quite surprised by. Um, there are some other things you obviously can't fix, like if, if the user thread is already trying to use setcom for something else, it's not going to interact well with this. Um, as a hack, I intercept the PRCTL syscall in my tree and catch the setcom commands in there so we can prevent user space from installing any new filters. But 
Um, user space probably wants to install filters sometimes, so that's it's not really a proper solution. And of course, this is pretty slow. Um, that shouldn't come as a surprise. We're now turning every syscall into a syscall plus a signal delivery plus another syscall. Um, and even the BPF JIT can't re uh, rescue us from that. But it's kind of fun. Um, probably not the right way to do things. So I had to think about if we were to do this in a more tightly integrated way, how might we do it? Um, the, the approach that I took was to um, basically hook into the, the front end of system call handling, um, which, because of the way the code is structured in the kernel, probably has to be an architecture-specific code today. And currently, I only wired this up for ARM64, but um, the concepts, at least, are not architecture-specific. Um, and what I currently did was I bounce system calls by doing something that looks a little bit like signal delivery, but it's much more minimalistic. Um, there's been some controversy about introducing new mechanisms for trapping into user space, um, but I should stress that this is not a general purpose thing, and I wouldn't propose that there's any API for user space to control this. It's kind of a private interface between the VDSO or whatever library you have and the kernel. Um, so in theory, we have a lot more flexibility to change the way this works between kernel versions and so on. Um, so there's some code showing how I did this in that uh, referenced Git tree. And similarly to the, the setcom signal handler case, um, the handler which we now put in the VDSO can, it can catch certain system calls and do special things. Um, it can make one or more real syscalls in response to that, or it can do something that doesn't involve entering the kernel at all, if that's feasible, or a mixture of those things. So, um, in common with delivering a signal, we need to get back to the original uh, call site where we came from somehow. Um, so for now, I push a frame onto the user stack, but this time it contains only those things that are absolutely required. For ARM64, this turns out to be the syscall number register, the stack pointer, because we may need to realign the stack when um, bouncing the, the system call, and the PC to jump back to, obviously. And on ARM64, it turns out to be convenient to save and restore the condition flags in the same place. But exactly what this looks like on different architectures could vary. Um, once we're done handling that syscall in the VDSO, then we need to jump back where we started and hopefully that you can do that directly. Um, what you need to do there is to jump back somewhere and get the registers back into their original state with a single instruction um, or restore the registers and then jump back with a single instruction. On x86, a return will do that or an IRET. Um, interestingly, on 32-bit ARM we can do this, but on 64-bit ARM it turns out not to be possible. Um, we need something that looks like an exception return and user space can't do that. Um, so for this case and possibly on some other architectures, we need to do a syscall in order to do, do that return, which is slightly annoying. Um, but in the cases where, um, where the, the VDSO handling of the syscall is going to do a real syscall anyway, we can piggyback on that. Um, so what I did was add an extra flag to the system call number which tells the kernel to, after executing the, the real system call, it will also pop this frame and <coughs> jump back to the original location. So just to give an idea of the complexity, this is what I added in the system call front end on ARM64. We just do a bounds check on the user space PC. If it comes from outside the VDSO, then we push this frame I just described onto the stack. Um, if we run out of stack, we'll have to kill the user task, but that's similar to delivering a signal. Um, assuming everything's fine, then we set the user space PC to that new entry point, and then we just return to user space after this. If we were within bounds, then we execute the system call for real, as we usually would. So 
Um, in effect, this is doing basically the same thing as that setcom filter that I illustrated earlier. A minimalistic no-op handler in the VDSO um, would look something like this. I should, stress if I, I should stress that this is not trying to be a C language entry point. Um, so you would have some architecture specific glue here. Um, but if you do anything interesting with generic code, you can call out to C, obviously, having saved any registers that you need to. Uh, but to do nothing and basically reflect all system calls back into the kernel, I just set this flag to make the kernel do the necessary return after the system call, and then I just trap into the kernel. And we stick unwind directives in, in here so that um, user space tracing and debug tools can unwind through this frame without needing to have hard-coded knowledge about its layout. So how does this compare? Well, from the point of view of what user space sees in terms of behavior, it's much more, much closer to a bare system call than the, the set comp case was. The stack overhead is much reduced, and it's worth observing, although I didn't try to make this work, um, because system calls from the VDSO are never bounced, there's no actual recursive bouncing here. So we don't, strictly speaking, need to put this data on the stack. If we allocated a per task user space page, then we could, uh, we could store the return information statically in there, and then we don't need to have multiple copies of it. So we might be able to reduce the stack usage to zero. Um, a page seems expensive for that, but if we have enough other things for which a per task page becomes useful, um, then it might start to look less of a luxury. And this does actually seem to work. Um, the ideal test would do all kinds of horrible low-level non-portable things. Um, I'll leave it to people, for people to decide whether system D ticks that box or not. Um, so far, I haven't seen anything I've run in user space go wrong with this mechanism enabled. And the overhead is much reduced compared with the setcom case. Um, the, the base overhead of getting in and out of the kernel um, increases by something like, theoretically, it should increase by two times because we trap into the kernel, we, tra we leave again to enter the VDSO, and then we enter the VDSO a second time to return, which we might not need on all architectures. Um, when I tested this, I actually saw the overhead quadrupling, and I haven't got to the bottom of that yet. Um, that may be some platform-specific issue. Um, but either way, that's just the overhead of the system call and doesn't include any of the actual system call implementation. So if your killer use case is calling get PID in a tight loop, then you'll see some increase in cost, but otherwise it shouldn't be quite as bad. Um, this doesn't mean that adding cost to any hot path is a great idea, but it, um, the important point here is that only legacy binaries that are making syscalls directly would experience these bounces. Um, so those would make the syscall, they bounce to user space, the VDSO does something, and then we call back into the kernel. Um, to avoid that happening, you need to port software that makes direct system calls, but that's not all software. It's, typically just C libraries and compiler support stuff, language runtimes and that sort of thing. I didn't try to enumerate all the cases, but it's, it's certainly much less than all software. And software that's been ported would then avoid that extra overhead. They just call the VDSO and <coughs> then that might do a real system call or it possibly won't enter the kernel at all if that's feasible, in which case it would be cheaper still. Unported software should still work, though. Um, it seems to me that there's a way to avoid to, to avoid the need to port as well, which is simply to have the syscall entry code uh, arranged to call the bounce page only if this is a syscall that would otherwise return uh, return enosys. So only the, so you so to, to, to make one of the, to, one, to move one of these legacy syscalls out, you'd rip it out of the kernel, out of the kernel syscall page, which would cause it to bounce, and then have the VDSO check is this one of the syscalls we implement, uh, um, and if it, and uh, and if it and if it doesn't, it, it would throw in, throw an Eno sys back out. That way, you'd only bounce for th obscure things like personality, which are hardly ever called anyway. So who cares if it takes four times longer? <laughs> <laughs> 
So the, the first um, path by which we get into the VDSO at all, that's, that's a bounce and that involves going through the kernel and it's it, not obvious to me how we avoid that. The, um, oh, is it, is it, is it, as soon as you go into the kernel, I'm assuming here that legit, that's the normal raw syscall entry path for, for syscalls we're not planning to rip out would remain. Yes. You wouldn't bounce <laughs> everything back out, every syscall uh, back yes, out, yes, only I the see. legacy ones. I, well, it's, only, it's only one bit mask check, really, isn't it? Or so, you don't, you so the way I've... You need to do that. You, all, all you need is, um, all you would need is to, for the syscall table, to, uh, you know, to, to the... Yeah. All you would uh, need to do in that case is for the, uh, you know, the that entry in the syscall table to, to, to uh, point to the, the reflection routine. Yeah. Yeah. So you actually end up with zero overhead. However, um, yeah, I'm going to be, uh, at, at a later point, I'm going to throw some more cold water at you. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the point. So. Um, yes, you're quite right. The way I've currently done things, all direct system calls that don't come from the media, so are bounced back out. So then you can do absolutely anything you like in user space. But that does add extra cost, and yes, another option would be that's actually selective in the kernel rather than being done for all system call numbers. Um, so there are still some things that can go wrong. Um, it's difficult to hide this mechanism completely from user space, so creative user space software writers might find ways of depending on the details of this. Um, Certainly, we wouldn't encourage it, but it's not clear how much this matters. Um, user space can do other things which would, may mess this up, like unmapping or moving the VDSO. <laughs> and another, yeah, some interesting things that can happen there. If you're in the middle of one of these bounces and another thread unmaps the VDSO or moves it, um, perhaps that's just user space shooting itself in the foot and maybe it doesn't matter, but it certainly needs thinking about. Um, static binaries is another case that came up. Um, classically, static binaries don't use shared libraries. That's sort of the point. There's no underlying technical reason why a static binary can't parse the VDSO and find entry points in there and call them. But it's, it's not something that everybody should implement longhand. Um, can you pass the microphone? Back? So... Um on 386, we actually have, a, uh, spe specifically on the 32-bit, we actually have a solution for this, which is that um, there is a generic entry point that is equivalent to a system call that um, is exposed through a different, uh, it's yeah, exposed a, explicitly. A the entry for that, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, yeah so... Um, you, you don't need to you don't need to do a full parsing of the dynamic structure you can you can you can just call that entry point and have a, in you know instead of executing an int 80 instruction yeah um, obviously if you wanted to move in the direction of having say a per system call entry point in the VDSO that doesn't work directly because then you might have a separate Entry point for read for write. Oh, you, you, you could do. You could do. Uh, you know. You could equivalently point to a table. Yeah, you could obviously do that. Um, so there's there's different options here. Um, you, you could you could even just have a generic like in that VDSO have some code that simply just checks for your number and comes to the right thing. I mean, yeah. You don't have to. The problem is when you when you expose uh, tables as data structures to the outside, you always cap yourself into boxes. Yeah. Um, sizes um, and such, right? The other yeah. option is that you simply pause the elf object and look up the symbols, which is uh, slightly painful to do yourself. I hang something up, it's like, I don't know, 50 to 100 lines of code. Um, I probably don't handle all the cases I should handle. Well, that's actually what, that's actually what we do, you know, that's actually, uh, you know, what we do now. Yeah. We, you know, you, you know, you have to get your symbols out of the dynamic section. Yeah, ideally the C library does that, and you don't have to care. But um, however it works. But it, it is you don't need a full blown, um, you know, you don't need a full blown linker to do that. Sure, and that that was kind of my point here, um, to um, make it clear that this doesn't break static binaries. Um, 
There are other places where this behavior will be observable, like ptrace, um, where the way I hook this in, system calls that we bounce don't appear in ptrace at all. So it looks like user space has jumped to another location and then ptrace sees the syscall made by the VDSO instead. Um, that's certainly different. It's not obvious whether that's wrong behavior or not. Um, there may be other policies we could, we could use there. Uh, some other things in exposed syscall internals as well. So there have been a number of discussions about setcomp this week. Ftrace also um, exposes what system calls are happening and so on. Um, the syscall interface does evolve over time. So any software using those does have to cope with things changing. Um, but exactly where you draw the line between what's an acceptable rate of change and what's gratuitous, I don't know. Um, that would be interesting to discuss. If this can all be made to work, though, what might we be able to do? Well, there are certainly some things that might be removable from the kernel altogether. So personality and set get robust list do little more than access a variable. If we have a suitable user page to store that in, we might just have the user library do those directly with no entry into the kernel. Um, some PLCTL commands might be uh, amenable to a similar implementation. I haven't investigated that in detail yet. Um, we might need different pages for things that are shared between different groups of tasks. So UMask, the UMask, for example, is a property of um, the group of threads sharing a file system context. Um, Having a whole page for that would obviously be kind of expensive. It largely depends on whether there are other things that we can put in there, whether it, it seems reasonable. Um, a file system context, at least, there's generally only one per user space process, so it's not quite as bad as having one per thread. Um, where system calls in the kernel have been superseded by newer ones that provide richer functionality, we might be able to just move all the glue for those out of the, the privileged kernel and have those done through user space wrappers instead. Um, another thing that I thought would be fun to investigate is whether you could move some of the signal delivery machinery and maybe the signal mask out to be stored in user space. Um, that's certainly not trivial in all aspects, and it might be impossible <laughs> in some areas. But yeah, it could be interesting to hack on. And ultimately, we could maybe define the kernel interface as a set of functions which we expose through a library instead of a binary interface. Um, and that potentially gives us a lot more freedom to redesign how those calls work across the unprivileged privilege boundary between kernel versions. Um, another thing that we don't currently, we manage in a sort of ad hoc way uh, is versioning of this interface. And binary formats such as ELF do provide some facilities to describe different versions of functions and so on. Um, so you can, for example, with ELF symbol versioning, you can make incompatible changes to functions without the need to define new function names all the time. Software linked against an older version of the library will carry on using the old version of that function, which supports the old interface. Um, this isn't that we can do the same thing in an ad hoc way, of course, but um, yeah, this might create different possibilities. To do all of that would obviously be a pretty, pretty big project, but. You could do parts of it, you could do things incrementally. And that is about as far as I got. So, yeah. If somebody wants to shoot down the idea, as I think they do. Okay, so I am going to throw um, something really, um, you know, really <laughs> uh, ugly at you. Um, and that is, um, in some ways, you've solved the easy part of the problem. Um, or, you know, attempted to solve the easy part of the problem. The part where we have real issues with backward compatibility are things like IOCTLs. And yeah. first of all, you literally can't know what an IOCTL, where, where an IOCTL is destined. Um, although in Linux, we try to not reuse IOCTL numbers. In, yeah. 
<clears throat> in uh, in practice, they you know they are driver specific, and so um, and and so the real issue there is the marshalling of data structures in the memory, and that can require an unbounded amount of memory. So you would have to have basically. You either have to have an unlimited stack, which we generally don't have, especially not in a multi-threaded application, and, or you would have to have your fallback code call malloc, and mm -hmm. that you know all of that has some very very messy consequences. Um, the other thing um, now. You know, to the good part is I, I I like your I like the idea that you have about um, about you know being able to do more things than we currently do in user space. Like right now, we do a few system calls. We mo most architectures can do a handful of system calls entirely in user space. But um, as you said, there might be additional things that we could do um, by having non-global data in, in user space. And that, that's, mm -hmm. very, that's very interesting. Um, now, a user space library that is just a user space library, not a VDSO, um, could reduce this problem without, with, you know, without complete, you know, without completely turning it upside down. Um, and the way it could reduce that problem is that we already have configuration options in the kernel to um, to uh, cut out certain you know certain legacy code. Mm. And if you don't do checkpoint restore, then you you know, or even if you do checkpoint restore, you have you know you can you can. You know, it, it can be a user option or a or a distribution option to gradually remove these uh, to gradually remove these legacy calls and and have yeah. them go through the and and but then you have to go through user space library. Yeah. So your view is that library would, if you say migrate using cryo to another host, you would migrate the library. You yeah. wouldn't attempt to use a different library. Yeah, so we already have, I think, four other questions queued up, and uh, we don't have that much time. So if questioners could keep their uh, questions a bit succinct, that'd be nice for everyone. So it's about the uh, signal mask in user space uh, part that mm -hmm. you said. Uh, come to talk to me if you want to do this, because restartable sequences registers a thread local storage, and I have ideas on how to do it on a per-thread basis. OK. Yeah. What about restartable sequences was something somebody else asked me previously, and I haven't fully dug into it, so. Uh, another ro big roadblock for this is POSIX thread cancellation. I don't think you can reliably implement it over this scheme. So you at mean all. If, if the thread is cancelled while we're in the middle of one of these things, or? Yeah, especially <laughs> if this VDSO code invokes several syscalls because you wouldn't be able to tell whether some resources have been actually allocated or not. So that kind of problems arise. Yeah, I guess that would place some constraints on how you implement and, those yeah. things. Um, some things you might be able to implement in a cancellation safe way so that it doesn't matter. But uh, if there were multiple system calls involved, yeah, I guess you're right. It could be difficult. And even if it was just a single syscall, how would you know whether uh, it has allocated some resources or not, if yeah, you that's a good point. can control this. I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, how would you handle a Noam MU, where you might not be able to have a VDSO? So the VDSO is a thing that's visible in memory somewhere. Um, uh, does Noam MU prevent that? I don't really see uh, that it would. Well, well <coughs> you'd have to have endless copies of it, well, a copy of it per task, potentially. And if you've got a static binary, uh, you may not be able to relocate it. So I don't have a lot of experience with no MMU, but uh, is there anything to stop 
Well, if you've got data in there, because you talk about storing the UMass can eat or something, you'd have to have many copies of it. But um, you could probably do it with FDPIC, but I'm not sure you could do it with flat. So for handling things like the per task data page, um, to avoid having a separate MM for every thread, which you really don't want, um, you could pass the pointer to that page into the handler in the VDSO, and I guess that should work with no MMU as well. So you, you pass a different address in depending on which task you're running. Would that work? <coughs> so one thing that strikes me is that uh, the compact layer, the compact system call layer we have in Linux does just a lot of argument shuffling, and it sometimes does it on the user space stack anyway. Uh, how much of the compact layer do you think you could implement with this, and would it solve ILP32 for ARM64? <laughs> so, <coughs> um, part of the problem with the compact layer is it requires you to convert like 32-bit arguments to 64-bit and so on, and we can't do that in 32-bit user space because we're 32-bit there. Um, there are probably some things you can do, but yeah, I haven't completely thought about it. Okay. Other types of ABI clutch layer where you're at least using the same ISA um, may be doable, but you would need information about argument types and so on. <coughs> so, I think we're about to run out of time, so. So, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna make a comment on the, the last thing. The, there is one single reason why we added a while well, we added a bit in the X32 B ABIs to know that you're using an X32 system call. And that was that the, there's a file in, in, this, in, in SysFS in the input layer, the, out, the, the format of which depends on if you are, it, it depends on if you are in the 32 or a 64 bit process it will literally print out in ASCII text, uh, text versions of numbers that, that are the size of long in user space. <laughs> and this is exposed through the normal file I.O. system calls. It's not an IOCTL. This, is, this was the one reason we had to track that into the deep layers. That sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, Thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, we're about out of time. Uh, thanks for that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure we're going to have lots more discussions about this <laughs> on mailing lists. So. All right, thanks again. And download the slide deck and follow the links yep. if you want to have a look at some terrible code. So. <laughs>